First of all, I want to thank Professor Aguirre for the invitation. I'm very honored to be here. So I'll be talking to you about uh, robotic surgery of the oropharynx, which is what I also discussed last year. So I wanted to look at it from a different perspective, a more critical perspective than what we went through last year with regards to the different applications for head and neck cancer. So just to state that I haven't got any conflicts of interest to disclose with regards to any of the medical device manufacturers that we'll be showing you. We've just had an excellent lecture on uh, HPV, so I don't need to say much, to be honest, but we've seen this uh, changing epidemiology. We're seeing that HPV uh, infection is increasing, and so is HPV-related positive oropharyngeal cancer. We also uh, have the data to say that uh, in terms of the standard of care, there is no question with regards to uh, chemotherapy with or without, sorry, radiotherapy with or without chemotherapy, depending on the indications, is and remains the standard of care for this disease. And indeed, we know from very large trials from the states that uh, the prognosis is far superior for those HPV-positive patients that receive uh, CRT and uh, compared to their HPV-negative counterparts. So what's the point of talking about surgery then? Uh, we have a very effective treatment. Uh, last year, we talked about the pendulum that's swinging between surgery and uh, non-surgical modalities for head and neck cancer. We can also call it the revolving paradigm. So the reason why surgery is re-entering this uh, circle relates to the severe late toxicity. So as we saw from the morning, from the presentations, there is uh, substantial toxicity that has to be taken into account with regards to uh, those treatments. And uh, I don't want to go into detail, but the particular one is the second primaries. Those HPV positive patients tend to be younger males that are non-smokers and hence their life expectancy is longer. So we need to consider also the harms that may result from the treatment that we're offering them. So that's where surgery comes into play. Back in 2004, Greg Weinstein and Bert O'Malley from Pennsylvania, they uh, quote the term TORS, transoral robotic surgery, uh, as a minimally invasive approach for uh, the treatment of uh, oropharyngeal cancer. Indeed, since then, uh, five years down the line, they obtained FDA approval for Da Vinci, not only for benign, but also for uh, malignant disease of the head and neck. A lot of advantages have been reported in the literature that this primarily relates to the minimal invasive nature of the treatment so that there is no large uh, incisions or mutilating surgery like we used to do, no need for mandibulotomies, visor incisions. Also reducing the need for free flap reconstruction, which in itself is associated with morbidity, potentially like donor side morbidity, increased length of stay in the hospital and increased intraoperative time that often is important in those patients that are likely to have other comorbidities. Also, uh, there has been a lot of discussion with regards to the ergonomics of the robot, like uh, the 3D view, the magnification, the degrees of freedom, and the list goes on. However, we live at an evidence-based medicine time, and we practice evidence-based surgery and medicine. So we need to look at it from a more critical point of view, from an evidence-based point of view. If we look at what the manufacturer of Da Vinci Intuitive Surgical have on their website, they will say that they are committed to evidence-based healthcare. And what they quote is the 13 and a half thousand papers that have been published since 1998 when the robotic console was first introduced for robotic prostatectomy at the time. They also will show you the increasing rise in publications with around 175 papers per month relating to robotic surgery, which includes tours. But the question here, it doesn't have to do so much with quantity, but with quality. How many of these studies are actually high level? The answer is none. There is no RCT uh, with regards to the role of TORS for uh, oropharyngeal cancer or TORS for any treatment, or, sorry, for any disease. The majority are level two studies, which are with small cohorts of usually less than 20 patients and retrospective in nature and of course non-randomized. Also, we need to consider healthcare value. Uh, Mike Porter from Massachusetts have, has introduced very nicely this subject, and this is a, a beautiful paper I recommend to you. But essentially, in a nutshell, what we should think about value, we should think of a fraction between the patient outcomes that we obtain from whatever treatment we offer to the patient, divided by the costs of that treatment. 
The problem that we're facing in surgery at the moment, and TORS, robotic surgery, or whatever type of surgical innovation, is that we haven't got metrics of innovation. So there have been loads of papers, including Lancet, New England, and Annals of Surgery, discussing this exact need. The fact that we need metrics, that's the only way that we can benchmark innovation, that we can conduct objective comparisons and, and inform policy. Without it, we, it's just discussion. So what I want to present to you today is uh, something that we've done at Imperial that re re relates to a network analysis of uh, surgical innovation using uh, both real data from the NIS and HES databases, but also academic data from citation networks. In this way, what we've tried to do is to, to actually measure both the virality and the value of robotic surgery and also TORS, rather than just talk about advantages and disadvantages. If we look at virality, there's no question that uh, robotic surgery is becoming viral. Viral in the way that there's more and more consoles being bought and installed uh, every year. There's now more than 5,000 uh, consoles internationally. And also the fact that we're, it's not just the United States, United Kingdom, and Europe, but now it has extended to the Far East and the Middle East, where we're starting to see series from there as well. So, network analysis. I, I don't have time now to go into detail in the mathematics of this, but essentially network analysis is a mathematical tool that allows you to look at a dynamic uh, pattern, like as, is, as innovation is in surgery, and look at the different players that you can uh, see via the nodes, and also the links can represent edges. Uh, so this can be any type of network, like citation networks, co-authorship, co-patenting networks, collaboration networks. So. The 13,500 papers are intuitive, are quoting. You can see this is the real world network that we have constructed. Each dot represents a paper. The diameter codes for the number of patients in that particular study. The color relates to specialty with TORS being, I think the TORS being here. And uh, also the links, which you can't see very well here, uh, relate to the thickness is uh, directly re related to citation. So the thicker the line, the higher the citation uh, between one paper and the other. Also, we constructed real world collaboration networks relating to tours. Again, uh, color coding relates to citation, size relates to innovation output here. And you can see who are the hubs of innovation relating to robotic surgery, who are the brokers of knowledge, and who are the more peripheral or satellite nodes. Before I go into discussing results, I just want to introduce also the concept of the surgical innovation funnel. It's important to think of innovation in surgery like natural selection. So what do I mean by that? Uh, there's going to be loads of ideas at the preclinical stage. Very few of them are actually going to uh, substantiate, are going to materialize into a product or a process, something material. And even fewer are going to be trialed, initially on animals and cadavers, and subsequently going on the right to the innovation final as it narrows, are going to, going to go into clinical practice and subsequently RCTs and eventually drive guideline formulation. So this is an important concept that we code within the network. The first metric we use is a structure of virality. This is a metric that is used by the big players in the industry, like Google, Facebook, Twitter, and Apple. And this is used to that for them to measure innovation in their industry and to be able to benchmark it. So we've used the same, but as applied to surgical innovation, robotic surgery specifically. And you can see examples here. Like, for example, robotic thyroidectomy gives you what we call a closed network with a, a broadcast virality, where where there is one center that diffuses to everybody else, as opposed to cardiac surgery where you've got an open network, an innovation network with a, long, uh, with a large virality and uh, many more players. So you can actually quantify all this by specialty for robotic surgery. We also introduced the surgical innovation value, which is a, a way taking into account uh, the real data with regards to the NIS and HES databases, and also the academic data from Scopus, from citations, to actually measure the value and rank it by the different specialty as applied to robotic surgery. And on the right, you can see the level of evidence it contributes to. So you'll be maybe surprised or not surprised to see that actually robotic surgery for head and neck cancer, whether that is TORS or thyroid surgery, actually is one of the lowest in terms of value. I will explain this, why is the case. And the highest, unsurprisingly, is prostate and cardiac, followed by gynecology. So this, we come to a bit of a paradox here. 
We've got a, an intervention that seems to be low value in terms of what we actually create or add to our patient, very costly with regards to purchasing the robot for the consumables, for the maintenance, for the proctorship. We're talking about a lot of money here. There aren't really any new indications for this, with the exception potentially of the unknown primary and the tongue-based mucosectomy looking for it. But there's an excellent lecture following, so I'm not going to go into detail. And as we've seen, there's no level, level one evidence to support TORS at the moment over the standard of care. So what is actually driving this viral diffusion process? What is driving it is market-related factors. This is from the BMJ. If you look at the operating profit margin, the highest is from Intuitive Surgical, which is almost double that of other giants in the medical device sector, like for example Medtronic, which is uh, 26 here, or Edward Life Science, who are producing the TAVI, the transcatheter aortic valve implantation, another big innovation that is going on at the moment. This is promoted by heavy marketing, and also by the monopoly in the market that I'm gonna come to. So marketing relates to digital marketing. There is a lot of ed educational activities involved with promotion of those devices by eminent surgeons and big conferences. There, so this relates to promotion to surgeons. There's grants that they provide for research into this field, simulators. But most importantly, there's targeted promotion to patients. So I'm sure many of you that practice uh, head and neck oncology or surgery, you'll, you'll come across patients that ask you to have their operation done robotically. And sometimes there's no even a robot to do that operation, like let's say a glottic cancer. It, there's no role for the robot whatsoever. And for other cancers like tonsil, yes, you can do it with a robot. Doesn't mean that actually you're offering anything to the patient that they wouldn't have with a bovi and a headlight or a laser. So we need to be careful as to how we interpret what is out there and not mislead people. So donations play a role. So this market monopoly has been in the literature uh, with regards to it being a poor deal because we're dealing with essentially only one manufacturer and as a result, no competition. Their co the, the cost is going uh, up really. There's no incentive to reduce the cost and there's no incentive to improve the quality particularly because there's nobody else to compete with. This cost issue has been reported uh, in several big editorials in journals, and of course we see it every day, whether in Greece, the UK, or the US. So I, I, I don't have time now to go into this paper, but essentially what we did a few years ago, we tried to, tar to find which patients are likely to benefit from tours rather than just offer it to everyone just because we can do it. But that is another matter of discussion. What about limitations? There are limitations, of course. We've discussed about cost, but what about the patients? Well, there are quite a few risks here. Hemorrhage is a, a substantial risk. Even if you tie the lingual facial trunk or even the whole external carotid artery, the collateral supply will develop within a couple of weeks. And it is quite common to see patients coming back with secondary hemorrhages, often hemorrhages that need to go back to the operating theater to be stopped. Area obstruction, of course, is a problem with uh, the need for tracheostomy, but also other underreported complications like cranial neuropathies, for example, hypoglossal nerve palsies, lingual nerve palsies, etc. At the moment, we haven't shown any added value or any newly created value for oropharyngeal cancer. And also remember that the axis is suboptimal beyond the oropharynx. So maybe hypopharynx as well, but anything beyond that, glottis, there isn't really a role for the da Vinci. So, to finish off, uh, I'm not, in this lecture, what I don't want to do is I, I, I'm not criticizing the safety or the effectiveness of TORS as a modality to treat oropharyngeal cancer. What I'm saying is that we should be more considerate with regards to how we actually take up this innovation or any innovation in surgery, especially based on the fact that there is no RCTs to actually substantiate all these things that we talk about as advantages. There are all, there's only one operation, essentially, as I said, the tongue-based mucosectomy, that is a truly newly uh, applied procedure that can be only done with a robot, that cannot be done without it. And um, uh, essentially, it's more to do with marketing and less to do with evidence. So the, I think the time is now for uh, competition in the market. What we need is competition from other medical device manufacturers. So with regards to the future, 
Medtronic will be introducing their new robot uh, early next year. Medrobotics have already done it in the last couple of years and we're trialing at the moment, which is a robot specifically designed for head and neck as opposed to the Da Vinci, which was taken from laparoscopic surgery to the head and neck. And Johnson & Johnson collaborating with Google to also create a surgical robot, which is a very interesting thing that we all look forward to. There are ongoing RCTs. Um, both in the United Kingdom, Terry Jones is running Pathos, and US, Chris Holzinger is running RTOG 1221. Beware though that both of these trials are testing transoral treatment, not robotic surgery specifically. It's TLM, transoral legs microsurgery, or TORS, and the same goes, I can't get the laser working, the same goes for Pathos. So even when those results come out, we cannot immediately stipulate uh, if TORS is shown to be better than this is because of TORS. The other thing is AR. We are using this already um, with regards to identifying neurovascular bundles in real-time imaging in order to preserve them whilst and sh not compromising our oncologic resection. And finally, as we said, new robots. And when we talk about robots, also think about micro-robots. In cardiac surgery, they already have intravascular locomotive micro-robots that run within the coronary arteries and destroy the thrombus. So there's no reason why we shouldn't take ideas from other fields and try to implement them in head and neck cancer. Finally, new applications, skull-based surgery, nasopharyngeal cancer. We need to look at robots that address those areas that are much less well accessed with conventional techniques. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the uh, beautiful presentation. Um, Dr. Weinstein, I think, would say that you belong to the skeptics. <laughs> yeah. As you know, with innovation, there's the Rogers diffusion curve. I don't know if you're familiar with, with regards to, in the beginning, it's a bit like a Gaussian distribution curve, where initially you have the innovators that come up with the new ideas and the new applications, and there's a lot of resistance. And ultimately, you go and get the, you know, you've got the early majority, the late majority, and the adopters. So naturally, people are going to be, you know, hesitant. Personally, I have used the robot for many years, and I actually know Dr. Weinstein very well. So I have to say I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to be against, I'm not trying to be against the robot, I'm just trying to be a bit more critical, especially from a surgeon's perspective with regards to what we are trying to achieve and what needs to be done to improve things. You know, if you can do something without a robot, it's a bit pointless to do it with a robot. We need new technology. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a tool and, uh, and you need to know the limitations and the benefit uh, that you can bring to your patients. Uh, thank you very thank much. You. One question from Yes. A uh, very nice talk. And if I combine it with the talk from last year, which was more clinical. Yeah. Uh, it was, the both talks are really very, very nice. Now, the question I have is uh, because the insurance companies usually they're basing their coverage on evidence based medicine. Yeah. Well, what, what's their point on uh, their, where do they stand for that, like for tours, for instance? Do they cover anything? The private insurance? Yeah, about. I can only answer for the UK. I, I'm sure Professor Aguirre will be able to answer for the US. Uh, for the UK, the answer is no, they don't. So uh, we practice it either in the National Health Service within the trials that we run for robotics at Imperial, or we do it uh, privately. But they don't actually cover uh, even for uh, tours, uh, which is supposedly the, you know, uh, as opposed to robotic thyroidectomy, for example, which is an even more debatable subject. Uh, so they don't, in a nutshell. Okay, thank you. One more question. Uh, well, I, I'm not aware of any issues of, co of coverage uh, from private payers in the US. It's covered as far as I know. In Greece, though, uh, that would be a good question, uh, and uh, what the cost could be in, uh, in a Greek hospital. You know, Dimitris, any. Any idea about that? It's, uh, it's expensive uh, and the coverage is problematic. So I think, I think um, it could be up in the air. So, so uh, the, the, the insurances can fight it. And there are a lot of insurances that refuse, refuse to pay. For example, tonsillectomy is not <laughs> Yeah, FDA I mean, there's approved. no indication really not, to do a tonsillectomy with the robots. Approved, uh, and um, at all, so they wouldn't, they wouldn't cover for that. So I think that it's, it's, a, it's a hard topic and uh, it's, it's very, very debatable. And uh, we had this discussion before and uh, I think you need uh, ingenuity in the billing uh, codes that you use uh, to get uh, reimbursement. 
I think that's why we try to do this network analysis and come up with some metrics, although I'm sure more will come in the future, because uh, in order to drive policy, you know, say that this is recommended for this or whatever, you need to have some sort of measurement to benchmark it. It's not just about talking, because if you look at the evidence, strictly speaking, as I showed you, there's no RCT that shows any advantage. So, one more question, yes, it, please. It's a comment, as a matter of fact. It's a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, mm. It is covered in the United States TORS, but the vast majority of patients that they go through TORS, instead of going through de-escalation of radiation, they go through chemo radiation post-op. Which the, uh, the chemo defeats. The, uh, and yeah. the issue is that the insurance companies now are questioning why TORS at all if chemo radiation is addressing the problem with a single treatment instead of adding a treatment that doesn't provide anything to anybody. And the question is, is this a technology looking for an indication more than an indication needing a technology? Let me add to this because that's an excellent comment and probably I should have made that as well. Because that's my concern. Um, so my advice if I made to surgeons doing it is that please do it, but I don't want to give afterwards chemo radiotherapy. So patient selection should, should be such that the chances that this patient will come to the radiation oncologist and the medical oncologist and will get chemo radiotherapy is minimal. So that's the point, because sometimes there are surgeries done that, that we, we feel obligated to do it. Like, like examples like, like the primary has been, um, they've done only surgery for the primary, for example, or uh, the surgery uh, was with positive margins. And I've seen that now even at Jefferson, um, as a, where I visit actually next week with uh, Dr. Moraitis, and the surgeons at Jefferson, they're in Philadelphia, I guess, competing with UPenn. They do a lot of tours. They're aggressive surgeons, very nice uh, group. Uh, actually, they have visited uh, Greece uh, a few months ago. But that's, that's the issue, that if you do a surgery like this and then you have positive margins or you you have then to give chemo therapy, you lose all the benefit that the TORS could have provided. To me, that's a major issue. Or for the neck, and let me add to that. If you, if you think that this patient is going to have adverse, adverse, uh, uh, adverse risk factors in the neck, just leave it as such, you know, just uh, let, let's give chemo RT. Uh, sorry, just to quickly comment. I fully agree with that, but essentially uh, the whole point is that uh, of TORS is the argument is that you can either, de first of all, perform ideally single modality treatment and or uh, de-escalate at least. So if you do TORS and you do everything else, then it's completely pointless. And I think that's where Chris Holsinger's uh, trial actually is gonna help a lot because as you know very well, he's using the intermediate risk patients that, that he then um, randomized to 50 or 60 gray rather. And so the low risk, they just go for the TORS, the high risk, they have both. So I, I mean, that's exactly proves your point basically. We, we shall see what it shows. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.